Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Chavistas Chronicles from Caracas. Today we have a special in, uh, interview with Francisco Dominguez. He is the head, the, the National Secret Secretary for the Venezuela Solidarity Campaign uh, for the United Kingdom. He is a Chilean, a political refugee that uh, is also an academic and one of the most important activists defending Venezuela uh, in the UK, but also in Europe, because the Venezuelan Solidarity Campaign is one of the most active and coherent uh, organizations supporting Venezuela, not only in Europe, but I believe that maybe in the world. So welcome, Francisco, for accepting the invitation. And uh, I'm going to start just letting, reminding you that uh, basically what we're going to do is like I want to ask you four questions. And at the end, if you feel, feel, if you feel comfortable, you can ask one or two questions to us about Venezuela, current state of affairs, whatever you find that might be interesting, not only for our readers, but for you people up there in Europe. So the first question that I have is uh, about, of course, the Venezuelan Solidarity Campaign. And I want to ask you, I mean, what, uh, what European solidarity initiatives the Venezuelan Solidarity Campaign is part of and how they interconnect? And, 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 and give me your perspective about Venezuela Solidarity Campaign and uh, and uh, and Europe in general. Yeah, well, Jesus, thanks very much for the invitation. I'm delighted to uh, participate in this. It's an excellent connection, and we Thank hope you. that we are able to continue this in the future. As in inviting you to things, and you inviting us to things. Not only you as an individual, and me as an individual, but you know, part of our organizations. Mm -hmm. The Venezuela Solidarity Campaign was established in 2005 and it is a very well established organization. We have an executive committee of 35 members which are elected once a year in the National Congress and the National Congress decides on the basis of very, basis of very rigorous protocols, decides on the policies that the organization is going to adopt in the near future, in the year that is coming. And the focus of the Venezuela Solidarity Campaign is the defense of the right of Venezuela to self-determination. This is the most important dimension of everything. We believe that we maximize support for the right of the Venezuelan people to determine their own future by focusing exactly on this. And on this one, we have had a tremendous amount of success because of the following. There is a long tradition of that kind of policy, that kind of political understanding of solidarity in the UK. We have one, one single Cuba solidarity campaign, and we have one single Venezuela solidarity campaign, and we have one single Nicaragua solidarity campaign, and one single Bolivian campaign, and I can go on. And this is not the case in, in Europe. In Europe, you have, in some countries, you have five, six, seven, I'm aware that some years ago there were 57 Cuban campaigns in one of the European countries. Wow. That is to say the solidarity is very much perceived in those places as a, something strictly party political, which is good in a sense, but it also militates against the possibility of maximizing effect. And our intention is to obviously change the perception of society. In our executive committee, we have had members of parliament, members of the Labour Party. We work to, today, we work with a parliamentary group, a formal parliamentary group called the uh, Labour Friends of Progressive Latin America that help Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia, Brazil, and you know, and anybody else. And it's an excellent kind of umbrella. And we therefore are in a position to influence politics at the maximum level. And in our organization, in our executive committee, we have national trade union leaders as well. And we have the affiliation of 18 national trade unions from the UK. That represents something like 80 to 85% of the organized working class unions in the UK. So this is a pretty solid organization. And I'm just the national secretary. 
we have a chair, we have vice chairs, and we have a president. So the structure is extremely good. So any time that we want to do something, I cannot make decisions. I have to consult with everybody else. But the results are always good because there is a full weight of several organizations, trade unions, political parties, parliamentary uh, individuals, and so on. We have a chapter in, in Scotland, the Scottish Venezuela Solidarity Campaign. They have autonomy because we believe Scotland is a separate nation. And therefore, we do not tell them what to do, although we work together very well. Um, ourselves from Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, as well as the Scottish Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, have been to various uh, Venezuelan events, you know, in the last period. So that's our approach. And as a consequence, our approach means that we have a significant amount of influence. At the moment, we are focusing quite dramatically on the question of the aggression and the sanctions against Venezuela. You know, where it's a huge campaign we have, denunciation, we concentrate particularly on the consequences of the sanctions, how it affects people. Because the media and the United States keep saying that actually it's, it's only against individuals in government, it's against the government, not against individuals. We have demonstrated conclusively and there is plenty of evidence to demonstrate that, you know, the, the human rights of 32 million Venezuelans have been denied by these sanctions because they haven't got access to food the normal way, they haven't got access to medicine the normal way, especially those who, who are chronically ill, um, especially all those who suffer special conditions, hypertension, diabetes, dialysis, and so on. And they haven't got access to health input in the normal way precisely because of the sanctions. And the sanctions deliberately intend to do this. And as a result of foc us focusing on this, there is a huge amount of consciousness in the, U in the country, in the UK, particularly in trade unions. We get invited by national trade unions, by regional bodies of trade unions, by uh, local branches of the Labour Party, by solidarity organizations and so on, where we go and tell the story and we publish information about that. So, that's our key campaign. And we constantly are on top of things regarding what is the latest that Venezuela is facing. And therefore we you know, produce information for that. The main purpose of our information is to equip our movement, to make sure that our movement is not influenced badly by the media bombardment that takes place every single day. And there is a second important campaign that we're concentrating on very heavily, which is the question of the return of the gold to Venezuela which is in the Bank of England. Mm -hmm. We characterize, I've been on television myself, in, invited to, or to be interviewed on this, and I characterize this as colonial pillage. There is no other name for it. It's colonial pillage completely naked. They set up a unit for the reconstruction of Venezuela secretly with Mr. Guaido sometime in the past one year ago. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that unit for the reconstruction of Venezuela, what they want to do with it is to obviously share in the spoils when and if the government of Venezuela is overthrown by the pressure of the United States. So they're ready in place to actually take advantage of this. And Vanessa Newman, the Guaido's representative in the UK, has already talked about oil contracts, has already talked about, you know, restructuring the Venezuelan debt. So, yes. and our petition to the Prime Minister to return the gold and the UK court to return the gold to Venezuela already have more than 10,000 signatures. This is extremely important. Now we are working very heavily to get 20,000. So that's one hour campaign. And obviously we are trying to influence Europe. The second uh, important campaign that we're involved with is something we initiated with Venezuelan friends as well as you know, comrades in Europe which is a campaign to persuade Europe to suspend the application of the sanctions during the period of the pandemic. These come from the following sources. We heard the General Secretary of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, saying that this should be done, that you know, given the pandemic, countries should not be applied sanctions of any kind whatsoever resources that have been retained should be released so that they can use the resources in order to buy inputs of every kind, health inputs, medicine, food, and so on, to fight the pandemic. This was followed almost immediately by a statement from Francis I, the Pope, 
who actually said more or less the same in in a homily that he made public some some time ago. And then the, the most interesting commentary about this came from Joseph Borrell, who is the foreign minister of the European Union, who has made the same point about four times already. That is to say, the European Union feels very uncomfortable by applying sanctions to a nation that is suffering enormously in the context of the pandemic. So we initiated a campaign, which is to persuade as many political parties, to unions, individuals, uh, celebrities, and so on, organizations, social movements in Europe to um, express uh, additions, you know, to express support for the resolution. And we have a tremendous success in Spain. We have support in the Federation of Trade Unions in Galicia, the Federation of Trade Unions in the country, Basque Country. We have the, uh, the Federation of UGT, the Socialist Trade Union Federation, Comisiones Obreras, they also support it. And most of the political parties of the left, such as in the Basque Country, Galicia, Catalonia, and in Spain itself, even in Andalusia, actually are supporting the campaign. This has been very successful in Spain. We have a smaller success in Italy, um, where you know most of the progressive party are supporting us. We've got several um, solidarity organizations and cultural organizations that are supporting us. We also got similar support in Ireland. And then we got support in Sweden, in Finland, in Romania, in Russia. Um, and I, I hope I don't forget one. But anyway, we have several countries that are supporting us. Sweden, Finland, but we have been not very successful. Though we've got some support in France, we don't think we've been able to open France yet. We need to open Germany and we're working towards ensuring that we have Portugal and Greece. And the reason is this. If you actually manage to get uh, parties of the left in Europe to support this resolution, and you look at their parliamentary representation in the whole of Europe, all of them represent something like in total, if you add them up, something like 400 deputies in national parliament. 400 deputies is quite a formidable force that we need to mobilize. And we are determined to get this. I mean, given that it's August, and given that everybody stopped, and given the pandemic, you know, had very, everybody very exhausted, we haven't been able to actually maintain the momentum in this month, but we're going to continue. We have organized um, video conferences in Romania, we have organized video conferences here in London in, 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 in collaboration with Spain, where we invited Octavio Solorzano from the trade unions, health trade unions in Venezuela, who gave an excellent presentation. We also invited Eugenia Rusian from Funda Latin, who also gave a presentation. And this is beginning to build up in Europe. These are the two things that we're working in Europe. And in Europe, the potential for a resolution to support the suspension of the sanctions against 32 million people is extremely popular. So we hope that this begins to acquire more momentum again once August goes. And you know, the idea is to influence not only the left, but also the center of politics, because there is this dimension. Nothing justifies, nothing legitimizes US foreign policy more than the support it gets from the European Union. Let me give me one second to deal with this European thing. The Europeans are totally hypocritical, as we know. Totally hypocritical. In a sense, they're slightly better than being totally brutal, like Trump. Hypocritical means, you know, they move back and forth regarding all sorts of things, and I stab you in the back if they can. But in with Guaido, they recognize Guaido, but actually they work with the Maduro government. They de facto recognized ambassadors of Maduro. They sent ambassadors to Caracas who actually present their credentials to Maduro on national television. So it's totally clear what is going on. And to make things even better, recently, after there was this diplomatic tension between the European Union and, and Venezuela, when Maduro expelled the European Union ambassador, I was very surprised that the European Union capitulated so quickly 
And then you could see Joseph Borrell rushing to talk to Jorge Riaza mm -hmm. to issue a, a co joint communique. This is a fantastic recognition. So what we think is this, we think that Europe is strategic. So this resolution is very important and we have to work with the devil and his grandmother in order to ensure that we're able to isolate the, the, uh, the United States. And if this campaign succeeds, I think we'll get somewhere. These are the two main things we're organizing right now in campaign. And therefore, you know, we interconnect with all the solidarity organizations that are in Europe that come from, you know, 15 years, 20 years of activity, political parties and so on. And we hope that we, we are able to set up something that hasn't existed from ever, which is a European campaign, that concentrate on a European basis to support Venezuela because the issue is one, Venezuela is entitled to its own self-determination and no aggression should be accepted and no attempt to overthrow the government by force is acceptable. So these are you know, quite simple positions and the suspension of the sanctions will add to this. That's essentially in a nutshell what we're trying to do. That's fine, that's fine. It's nice to hear all the work that you are doing. That's a lot of work, man. I know. Uh, and, 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 and you already answered all the, all the issues in, in, in connection to the, how you work with European partners. I mean, all these activities that you already mentioned uh, in connection to the most important initiatives that you're running right now, the one about the, the sanctions, the one about the gold, uh, are incredibly are amazing. I mean, uh, so so that doesn't surprise me because I all I, I have always been told that the Venezuelan solidarity campaign is the most uh, articulated uh, solidarity organization. Uh, but but it still surprised me anyway. Just, so just now, let, me, let, let me add this, uh, Jesus, because I think it's part of the question. We do not know how things are going to work out in, with the gold. We don't know. But what we do know is that Venezuela has been given the right to appeal the court decision, which opens another possibility because the issue will be highlighted again. And it's disgusting from the point of view of normal people, it is disgusting that somebody is stealing the gold, which doesn't belong to them, trying, suggesting that they're going to give it to this criminal who doesn't, doesn't control even a street lamp in Venezuela mm -hmm. and is not in a position to do anything for the people of Venezuela, doesn't want to support the sanctions and not to give it to Venezuela. And what, is, what matters to us is if we intensify the pressure, we do not know whether this is going to work, but we're going to intensify the pressure anyway. If we intensify the pressure, by the time when the appeal takes place, Guaido may be very significantly more weakened than he is now. So therefore, the government of the UK and the courts in the UK are going to find it even more difficult politically to actually give it to him or confirm that decision. That's number one. And number two, in Europe, I think the possibilities are better. And if we manage to say one bank, one, Banco Novo from Portugal, Euroclear, you know, it doesn't matter to us, but the idea is to, to, to pursue one bank and one government in Europe to say, okay, look, this is enough is enough. We're going to give the resources back to Venezuela because they're going to fight, you know, the pandemic. And the reason why this can be confirmed is because very cleverly and very ethically, the Venezuelan government has proposed that these resources are given to the development program of the United Nations to ensure that the resources are going to be spent on what they claim they're going to be spent. So it is very difficult to say no. If we manage to get one, then that will open up the floodgates. And I think we'll be in a different situation, especially now the United States declining. Europe is looking towards, you know, what to do with itself. And that's where we come in. And let's hope that our pressure works. That's fine. That's fine. That, that's a good point, actually. And it takes me to the, it somehow connects to the next questions that I have. I, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, ask you the questions, but I believe that most of them, uh, you already have answered part of them. But anyway, the, the second question was, how do you see the Bank of England looting of Venezuelan gold? Uh, and what do you see is going to happen? 
So you already said, but maybe you want to round out something or yeah, I I think the the moral pressure that we are raising, um, I mean, it got us ten thousand signatures in, in no time. I mean, we are surprised at ourselves. We normally get you know one thousand five hundred, which is pretty good. Mm -hmm. To get ten thousand, we already have ten thousand two hundred already. I checked it every single day, and the more we get. The, the better it is from our point of view because the argument and this is why it's going to be difficult for them although they might still do the wrong thing the argument is this the judge Nigel Tia said the following in his verdict which is very long we read it all we examine it and so on and he says he makes basically two points he said number one the UK courts are not going to make any decision different regarding the recognition of the government of Venezuela, different than the one made by the UK government. That's the first position. In other words, it's not a legal position, it's a purely political position. In other words, the court is not doing the right thing, it's doing the legal thing, because they are under the UK government, which is weak. That's number one. Number two, they say, but additional to that, Mr. Guaido is claiming Article 233 of the Venezuelan Constitution, for his said proclamation as interim president, which is completely false. Yes. And I don't think that Nigel Tier at the time, the judge at the time when he made this statement, was aware of the actual uh, Article 233. Article 233 makes it very clear because we have publicized it, you know, everywhere, saying if the president dies, if the president is ill, if the person is physically or mentally incapacitated, if the person is arrested for corruption, if the person is recalled by a referendum, and so on, then you can declare vacancy. And in that case, it's got to be replaced. But constitutionally, the person that has to replace it will be the vice president, as Maduro replaced Chavez when Chavez died. And then the person has the responsibility constitutionally to organize elections in one month, something which Mr. Guaido has not done. So not only the premises are false, but also the constitutionality of Mr. Guaido is in question. And it seems to me that this is what the lawyers, I don't know the details, I don't have the details. And it's up to the lawyers obviously to discuss this themselves without us knowing. But my impression is that the lawyers are going to concentrate on this. So given that that is the position, and given that the position of Guaido is vanishing, literally as we speak every single day, is becoming less and less and less significant. And now that the elections in Venezuela for the National Assembly are coming up, and there are new political actors coming from the right wing of every kind, the diversity of opinion and the arrangement with a session of business, I think it might create the conditions for it. There is a final factor which I want to mention at this stage in terms of what can happen. And it is that if the, if the decision is prolonged or doesn't take place until after November, the third. That is to say, if the decision takes place after the election of Mr. after the election in the United States, mm -hmm. and Trump does is not elected, or Trump is elected, you know, the UK government it seems to me is going to have a significant amount of more autonomy because Trump may decide that you know Venezuela is not a priority anymore because it's been a failure after failure after failure after failure. And if it is Joe Biden who has made very terrible statement regarding Venezuela in the last period, but it's an election period, he's not going to do anything different. But you know, when and if he is elected, I doubt very much that again, in the case of Biden and Demo Democrats, that is going to be their priority. The United States economy is going to be in complete mess. And the level of the crisis of the pandemic is going to be terrible. The debt in the United States is increasing exponentially by the week. And therefore, Mr. Biden or Mr. Trump, whoever wins, are going to have to focus, whether they like it or not, on other priorities rather than Venezuela. Because both of them know, and they've said it as much, that Venezuela is a tough cookie. Venezuela is not easy to break. And Venezuela can resist. And it will continue to receive, especially in the last period when things, although they're bad, they're improving, improving marginally. And Venezuela is able to operate internationally 
in the financial, economic, and other fields, particularly in the geopolitical, but also diplomacy. The skillfulness of Venezuelan diplomacy is absolutely impressive. So therefore, you know, to have these idiots in, in Washington who don't, don't know except shooting from the hip, that's what they know. Uh, my desire is something else. So there is a chance, but we'll see, and we'll keep you definitely for. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. One, one of the things that you mentioned that I believe that is important to highlight is that, is that uh, I don't know how to say it, the the fact that the in reality the UK government disregarding what they say about not recognizing Maduro, in fact they do recognize them. I'm telling you this because what you just said about the important things that the lawyers in the UK might be working on and things like that. So I believe that that's very strong uh, argument. But anyway, uh, uh, let's hope that that, that finally uh, the the judge decide uh, uh, the way it should decide. Yeah. The judge, the judge in Argentina said that that was his preliminary verdict. In other words, he left the possibility. You know, it's very rare. It's very rare that a judge allows an appeal on something like this. It's very rare. The judge has the chance, has the choice to say no. And in this particular occasion, they said yes. And it seems to me that this is the reason. It's a fundamental, but you know, more broader reason is the UK doesn't want to miss out on possible contracts once and if the situation in Venezuela begins to normalize. And it's too important for them. So when it looked like the government was going to be overthrown, the UK, you know, went with the United States. But now that they know that the situation is not like that, and, and they're going to be left outside because Britain is out of the, the European Union, and the Europeans are working with Venezuela. Certainly Germany and others are moving in that direction. So the UK, who are, you know, when it comes to money, that's the most important thing on earth. Yes. So therefore, there is a practical, pragmatic possibility that might contribute to them making the right decision. At the time, at right now, the position is the United Kingdom is more or less an appendix of US foreign policy. Yes. And therefore, it's unlikely to do something different. But given the crisis in the United States, you never know. There are these possibilities. Anyway, we'll explode them to the full. Listen, listen, and do you have any timing about the this legal process, do you have that, those things I know, right? It's not no, public. no, there is no, there is no information regarding the deadlines. I think there is a protocol, but we are not aware of it. And understandably, the, the Venezuelan lawyers have not informed anybody about anything. And the British side hasn't informed anybody about anything. And the newspapers have speculated very little about it. When, they, when the decision was taken to give it to Waido, to give the goal to Waido, the newspaper were shocked. They couldn't believe it. Not that they criticized the measure, but they couldn't believe it. They expected the UK to do something. And so, especially in the context of the uniform reconstruction, all these secret things that the, the UK government has established. So we have to wait and see. Uh, I think we have to be, op we have to have optimism of the will and pessimism of the intellect. <laughs> okay. I got it. I got it. Okay, now let's move to the third question. Uh, how do you see the international crim criminal court process filed by Venezuela? Uh, I mean, how do you see it uh, itself? And, uh, uh, and, and that connects to what you just said about one of those initiatives that you have and connection to U.S. sanctions, but uh, I, I just want to know if you see, if you have some sort of connections with this. Um, um, the, conne the connection is, the connection is with the, uh, with Venezuelan diplomacy. Um, I mean, you have a first class foreign minister, you know, it's, it's excellent. And it takes it from a tradition from another excellent prime, excellent uh, foreign minister called Nicolas Maduro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and then you have another excellent foreign minister which was called Hugo Chavez. 
you know, when it came to the international arena, he was excellent. In the last period, I've noticed, and this is my analysis, I noticed that the foot, um, diplomacy of Venezuela has been very skillful, making sure that they never break all the bridges. They never burn all the bridges. They keep talking. They keep coming back to it. They keep sort of moving around. They keep mobilizing different forces. And Venezuela, as a result, has been able to win several discussions on the situation of Venezuela in the National Security Council. To the point that the United States has been forced to veto possible resolutions against them. That's a clear defeat. And it's not only once, it's several times. That's number one. Number two, they've established an excellent relationship with the key members of the United Nations bureaucracy, I would call them, you know, Antonio Gutierrez, the, even the group of human rights with whom there are several issues, particularly Bachelet. But even with her, Arias has insisted in keeping talking to her and bringing her to come to Venezuela, although she made issues terrible reports which are completely ridiculous but anyway the very fact that Venezuela insists is an indication of it then there is the non-aligned movement of which you know Venezuela has played very well and then Venezuela has been selected and elected to several key bodies of the United Nations so and when it put to the vote some time ago this was four months ago two months ago when he put to the vote, because it was Pompeo who brought the discussion to the National Security Council of the United Nations stupidly. And Venezuela won the debate and managed to get a resolution that now 100, 168 and 180 countries more or less recognized Maduro. And you know, very few of them didn't. So these are huge political victories. And obviously that is the context within which the International Criminal Court is going to operate. And therefore, it is possible that Venezuela managed to win a significant victory in this because it's got all the components around it, as it were already in place, not only in terms of the politics, which I described, but also I think in terms of the case. The, the case of Venezuela is irrefutable. I mean, there is so much absolutely, absolute evidence. It's so blatant is so flagrant, there is so much of everything that Venezuela doesn't need to demonstrate anything because it's obvious it's, you know, in the light of day, literally every single time. And the more the United States messes up, the more Venezuela adds to her case. So in this sense, it seems to me that Venezuela is doing extremely well. Now, where the, the, the ICC take a decision against the United States, which is possible, it's not guaranteed, but it is possible, if it were not to take a decision against the United States, people would say, how is it possible they didn't, when you know, the case was so overwhelming? If you were to take it, I don't think the United States are going to be penalized in any way whatsoever, because they will just do whatever they want. But it will be such a moral victory, which will be extremely important. So that's why I think they've gone for it. I, I have the impression that you know, these United Nations bureaucracies somehow sympathizes with the case because it doesn't like sanctions against any nation. It doesn't like wars that take place, you know, completely out of control. It doesn't like the, the instability that United States foreign policy is creating just about everywhere. Literally, wherever it goes, it causes tremendous amount of instability, death, mayhem, and so on. And eventually, ultimately, every time the United States causes a mayhem somewhere, Europe pays the price because refugees come to Europe. The economic consequences are felt by Europe. Uh, Europe has to take, take, you know, take the tubs and so on. So there is a receptiveness here in, in Europe. I don't know to what degree, because there is a stream right wing as well, which is quite strong. But there is a receptiveness here among reasonable people, not necessarily winning, but you know, people like Angela Merkel and a few others who are prepared to say, we cannot go that far. And in that sense, it seems to me that it is possible that many of them will say, okay, if Venezuela gets this way on this one, that may discipline the United States, that may start behaving. But everything it seems to me hinges in terms of, you know, Europe acquiring a more independent policy on what happens at the election and what is the outcome after the election in the United States. I think everybody's waiting for that. Once that happens, we will know exactly where we are. Yes, that's true. That's true. 
Okay, so now we move to the last question. And it is also, we already have talked about it, but anyway, this is the, the, the question. How COVID-19, Brexit, the US decline, might have an impact in the European imperialism, especially towards Venezuela and Alba countries? Well, I mean, I partly answered this already by showing the pragmatism of the UK, of the European government, including the UK government. You know, that actually, the UK government sent the ambassador to Caracas. It has an ambassador in Caracas who presented his credentials to Nicolas Maduro. Um, and the European Union made it very clear to Juan Guaidó. This was made public by Federica Mogherini. She said, we recognize why those representatives in Europe as why those representatives in Europe, we are not going to give them the status of ambassadors. We will not recognize an ambassador. If they want to talk to us, or if these representatives want to talk to any European government, that's fine. So Europe is already moved quite substantially in the right direction regarding you know, Venezuela. In practice, the European Union is trying to see ways to work with Venezuela but avoiding retaliation from the United States, particularly on the financial side of it. And the United States is quite brutal about this. So, and, and at the same time, the United States is quite brutal about it. The European Union is very cowardly about it. So you have, you have a bad combination there. So that's number one. Number two, uh, the pandemic has caused a huge amount of political crisis and economic crisis in, in, in Europe. In the UK, the UK is one of the worst countries affected because the government had to make a decision different from Venezuela where people before profits was number one priority and still is. And that's why, you know, it's very successful in terms of fighting the pandemic, although there's been some expansion in the last period, but it doesn't compare with, you know, say Spain or France or any of these countries. Mm -hmm. And certainly the UK outside the European framework is pretty isolated because it's totally at the mercy of the United States. There is nobody else that the United Kingdom can go to. So the pandemic that is causing a political crisis, an economic crisis and a health crisis at the same time, in the context of being abandoned by Europe, Europe by not being with your European partners, you have nothing else except capitulate. And that's the position of the so Brexit is having tremendous difficulties, it's causing tremendous difficulties in the Conservative Party. Boris Johnson is constantly under pressure to apply rigorous lockdown, and then the day after he says he's not applying rigorous lockdown, he's opening up. And then the day after that he says he's going to apply rigorous lockdown, and the day after that he says he's going to open up. And it is obvious, there are people who say, it's very serious, we have to take very strong measures. And there are some capitalists who say, we need the business to get back in, you know, in, in activity. Mm -hmm. And he's caught between the two. So the, what is missing here is unfortunately is the fact that the defeat of Jeremy Corbyn at the last election. Had Jeremy Corbyn performed well, not necessarily win the election, but perform well in the election, and remain as a leader of the Labour Party, I think we have a much better situation to fight back. Yes. Because Jeremy Corbyn was defeated, and because the Labour Party was defeated as well, then he stopped being the leader of the Labour Party, and that has weakened the possibilities, temporarily at least, weakened the possibilities of the left, and the new leadership is, is moving to the right quite sharply, you know, more and more every single day. So that's what's complicating our life here. In terms of Europe, and this applies to the United Kingdom as well. The level of debt, they suffer from the same problems. They have a crisis, which is, you know, health, economic, and political at the same time, all of them. And the Europe is extremely indebted. The level of external debt of Europe is huge. It's gigantic, and with this, it's going to get worse. Let me give you an idea of the level of indebtedness. Countries such as Portugal had a debt which is, represents something like 130% of the GDP of the nation. Italy has something like 140% of the GDP, the gross domestic product of the nation. Um, Germany is about 85% of this GDP. 
The UK is about 100%. Uh, Greece is about 187%. And this is not the only countries that are affected in this way. Literally all of the countries of the European Union are suffering enormously because being in such a level of debt in the context of this crisis where there is no economic activity or certainly a massive decline in economic activity, there is a rise of unemployment, there is a decline in GDP, the level of decline of GDP on average in Europe is in the is between 11 to 14 percent. This is in something like six months. That's massive. So therefore, you know, they are caught in these pincers, which is this. The United States has a debt which in the last period increased from 23 trillion dollars to 26 trillion dollars. It increased three trillion dollars in three months. And the GDP of the United States is 20 trillion. This is a clear manifestation of the climate of the United States. So Europe is, is facing with the following issue. If it goes with the United States, which is, is weak at the moment, it's not going to get anywhere. It's going to get worse. Austerity is going to be applied on them. The IMF is going to be used. The United States is going to savage them to take advantage of them as he's doing to benefit his own economy, regardless of what happened to Europeans and regardless to any consequences that this may have. So the Europeans know that this is the case and they have the possibility of linking up with China. China is the rising star in the East. Whatever we may think about China, the fact of the matter is, is the economy number one and is the only nation on earth that is offering other countries something. Europe is offering very little except um, a modified version of US foreign policy, but pretty much the same. You know, sanctions, the European Union goes along with it. When it comes to investment, the European Union doesn't invest because there might be sanctions. Uh, when it comes to supporting US foreign policy, well, it does. When it comes to wars, it doesn't like them, but it supports them eventually. And if it can participate, it does. So that's just in Libya, Syria, and so on. So, the European Union knows that this is going to get worse if it goes with the United States. And if it goes with China, the chances are very good. The level of investment will increase massively. The quality of the technology that is going to come in here with 5G and all the rest of it is going to be enormous. China offers huge markets, offers, has the possibility of offering huge amounts of credit and huge amounts of investment which is what the European economies actually need. And the, U, the, the United States offer none of that. So this election in the United States seems to me is going to be quite crucial. And just to give you an idea how bad it is, in a normal time, the level of unemployment in Spain was in the region of 20 to 26%. That's a normal time. But when you actually, in normal times, measure the level of unemployment between the young people of 18 to 24, that went up to 52, 56%. That is to say, the level of unemployment is gigantic. And this is the same in Italy, it's the same in many other European countries. I think Germany is the exception. But if you look at France, which is applying neoliberal policies, you know, Ireland and so on, it's pretty much the same. So. They are really living on borrowed time, to use an expression. So they have to start making strategic decisions. And if you take the East as a sort of, you know, geopolitically, without thinking about the politics of the nations, you have China, you have Russia, you have, you know, the Middle East, and you have Venezuela, you have countries who have huge potential, countries which already have, already have huge potential. And these countries do not interfere in your internal affairs when they invest in you. They, is, they have the policy of win-win. So we, we have to wait and see whether Europe is prepared to go along with US sanctions. And I think the key is this, and I'll finish this point with this. 